I am always so thankful to get the opportunity to come before you guys. I know I'm on the platform a lot with singing and stuff, but I never take it for granted every Sunday, every Wednesday, every chance we have to get behind this sacred desk. And I'm just super thankful tonight for the opportunity just to be here. I've never had to just open up for myself. And I said, Jade, you can't make me just start talking right after worship. But here we are starting talking right after worship. So <laughs> I'm not coming tonight with a message that I think is just profound and maybe you've never heard of it before but I think it's a simple message and a message that's important to our identities as Christians in this house something that if we grasp I feel like it will help us in our daily life and in our walk with him so that's what I'm trying to bring before you today when I began thinking about what was I going to talk about you know I was saying Lord just send me a word and he quickly checked me and said I've already sent you a word it's the word my word you need to just go to it and find it and that it's in there for you already. So I began searching in it and trying to find it. And I was inspired by that and also just inspired by the natural season that we're in. We know that this weekend coming up is Halloween. And I was thinking about that, thinking about all the costumes I've been seeing in the stores. And that's what sparked my inspiration for this message tonight. So I first began to think about Halloween. And this might not be going the direction you might think it is. But thinking about that natural season, the first thing I think of is the costumes and the disguises and getting to dress up. So my mind went to that and I thought, what makes this day, this night so appealing, this activity of getting to dress up like this? Was it the candy? Is it the costumes? Is it an excuse for some to have a cheat day on their diet and to take their kids candy? And it would be yes, it's all of those things. And there's also a spiritual aspect to it as well, why this holiday is the way that it is. But I wanna just focus on that surface level tonight. And I begin to think just for one night of the year, anyone can be whoever they want to be and no one can tell them otherwise. It's an excuse for an appearance. It's an excuse to have an identity. And it's all about looking the part. That's what this night is dedicated for. And I just begin to think about that. And I used to think about all the little doctors and the little firemen, the little policemen we're going to see on Halloween. But how I wouldn't really trust any of them to actually perform any type of service for me. Because I know they're not qualified and that it's just an act. It's just a game. It's just for fun. And that kind of stuck with me. That how many nights a year other than October 31st are there people walking around and those statements still apply to their lives? That it's an act. It's all about appearances and it's just for fun. And they live their lives like it's Halloween every single night by playing a part, but they don't really put in the work. They're not really qualified to act the way that they are. And it led me right back to identity. No wonder this holiday takes off so much. We know that our, our nation as a whole is having an identity crisis. So they're going to have another escape, another reason to play another part and to wear another disguise. It's another event for us to mask who we truly are on the inside and to have some kind of facade. So if I could title this tonight, I'm going to just title it The Disguise. And I think that it's important in ourselves that we recognize who we are and who our identity is. It's a crisis across the nation. And sometimes I think even in the church, we forget who our identity is and who we are called to be. Because we've been given more than just a costume or an act or a role to play for one night. But we are given a charge of a new identity to put on. Not just for a season, but every single day, picking up this new coat and walking in the identity that God has for us. And I thought to myself, if we really knew who we were, how powerful could we be? If we knew who we were called to be, if we could really get a hold of the depth of our identity, of what we are here for, if we understood the gifts and the garments that the Lord has waiting for us, would we walk around how we are right now? If we just really knew, surely we wouldn't put labels on ourselves like oppressed and lonely and down if we truly understood who we really were. Maybe we would walk with more authority or more peace or more joy. We wouldn't need a mask. We wouldn't need a fake smile or an excuse to be someone that we're not because it wouldn't be about a fake it till you make it attitude or it just getting by if we really knew who we were, if we really found our identity in him. So I thought to myself, do I know who I am? Does the church know who they are? And how can we find that? So I turn to scripture because I know that that's where it will tell me who I'm supposed to be and what my identity is. So many people turn to so many different things to find who they are when we have the answers in front of us every single day. We just have to choose to find out for ourselves who we are. So I turn to some scriptures and I'm going to read just a few of them to you about who we are. So what is our identity as a Christian? First, we are overcomers. And I think sometimes we forget that. We walk around like we're defeated and we're the victims, but why? Because we have the power to overcome. 
We find that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So in that verse, he has granted us the power to saying that if we are born of God, so if we have taken on this identity, we have the power to overcome because he overcame. So that's one part of our identity. What's another part? We are called to be people of peace. In John 16, verse 33, he says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So he has called us and directed us that it is a part of our identity to walk with peace. And it relates right back to being overcomers, for he says, because I have overcome the world, that's why you can have peace. Because you don't have to face that and take that as your reality, because you know that you have the ability to overcome. Continuing with that, our identity, we are people without fear. But do we live that way? Do we walk without fear? Because Isaiah 41 and 10 says, fear you not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yea, I will uphold you with this right hand of my righteousness. And I read that to myself multiple times. I read it over and over. And what I saw was, number one, we're instructed to not be fearful in that verse. And we were reminded that we are not alone. We are reminded that we are strengthened through him, that our help comes from him, and that we are upheld in his righteousness. So if he just reassured us all those things, but yet so many times, why do we let fear in? Why do we let it consume us and we have the ability not to? And I noticed how it's because the Lord is asking us to not make this just an identity to put on, but to let it fully consume us, to let his identity take over every part of our lives. And even in that scripture, Isaiah 41.10, I want you to notice how the Lord is showing you to draw closer to him and the levels that he will draw closer back to you. I'll break that down so you understand what that means for. So first of all, he says, fear not for I am with you. So he lets us know that he's going to be there with us in the middle of the trial. Not that we're not going to have them, but that he's going to be present. So that should be the first level of assurance. And that should be enough. Knowing that he's there, that's enough. He could have stopped right there and we still could have lived a life of peace and without fear. But he went a step further. And he says, be not dismayed for I am your God, and I will strengthen you. So not only is he in the room with us, but he is now giving us the strength to walk without fear. So he's there in our midst, and now he's given us a weapon to come against the fear. It's his strength. But then he goes even further than that, and he says, and I will help you. So not only does he tell you you can do it, not only does he give you the strength to do it, but he's also going to come beside you and help you to get through it. And he could have stopped there, but he went even further. And he said, and I will uphold you with my right hand. So not only is he in the room, not only did he give us the tools, not only did he help us with it, but he is literally holding us as we're walking through it. If we could understand that and just grasp that, why would we walk in fear? Not only is he with us, but he is helping us. He is empowering us. He is holding us and he is walking us through the trials. Sometimes we feel so alone, but how could we when we are in his hand? I think it's just so important to realize that he is asking us, even in that verse about fear, to just draw closer to him. And he is showing how he is drawing closer to us. And going on further into what is our identity, we are called to be a people with joy. In Psalms 32, 11, it says, Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, and all that are upright in heart. He's instructed us to live a life full of joy. But yet sometimes we just accept being lonely. We just accept the label of being depressed, or we're just going to be down. We don't live that vibrant life. But how different would the church look if we understood that joy? If we truly had hearts of praise continuously and worship continuously, would we not be filled with his joy? And I think that all of those things are important to understanding our identity. But it's also important to understand that when we are taking on this identity, it is an entire new man. It is an entire new creation and a new identity we are called to put on. For the old will pass away and we step into something new. And that brings me to my main text, Colossians 3.10, going through verse 17. I'm going to read that before you. And the first thing is, before I read, my little subtitle in my Bible is called Put On. So I'm encouraging you tonight to put on a new man and a full identity. And this is what it says starting in verse 10. 
and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bound nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called to one body, and be ye thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in your wisdom in teaching and administering one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. That showed us a lot of our identity in that passage. That gives us a lot of instructions on what we are to put on every single day that we are accepting this call because it is a daily choice to crucify the flesh and to pick up and to put on this identity. So I'm gonna walk through that in the order that it came to me about putting on these garments. So first of all, it says, put on the new man. That's the first part. You have to accept it as a new garment. Just like the costumes you will see this weekend and the disguises and the mask and sometimes the fake emotions that we put on every single day, we are instructed to put on physically a new man. And I don't believe it's strictly a list about what to actually wear and what you're going to have to do and not to do, but we are instructed to put on a new garment. And I believe that the encounter that we have when we do that should be radical enough to change our physical appearance. Because when we are instructed to put on a garment, is another way of reaffirming that our encounter with the Lord was that strong that it altered our physical being. The way that we carry ourselves, the countenance that we have, when we walk in a room, there should be a distinction. For we have this great identity. And it's all of those things. But yet we still allow these other labels to stick with us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, help me. For we have an identity above any label or anything else that will try to come against us. And if we truly understood this power, would we not walk and carry ourselves in a different manner? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that a true touch of salvation will lead us to walk in a different manner. And that is what comes on with the putting on of the new coat. It's a quality of modesty, yes, and it should affect us in our outward appearance. But I also believe that it's about an internal thing just as much. And that is why going down into verse 12, he talks about putting on, he's describing the fruit of the Spirit there. And it's just as much an internal thing as it is a physical thing. So as we're altering our physical appearance, it should also be altering our inner man's appearance. The way that we speak and the way that we behave and the way that we act towards other and the emotions, how we express them. That is all a part of our identity. And in all of it, it should be a reflection of who Christ is and what he has done for us. And he says that we should also have hearts of forgiveness. He even goes as far as to tell us to forgive like he forgave. He forgave before we accepted it. He forgave without guarantee that we would even say yes, but he did it anyways. So that means before the person comes to you, before the problem looks like it's being resolved, before they bring you an apology, that's when we're instructed to forgive is before all of that. We forgive first if we're truly forgiving like he does. And I think that is so important. Later, he goes on to say that there is love. And I love what this version says. It says it is a bond of perfectness. Love is always regarded as important, but I think it's important to understand that when love is referred to as a bond of perfectness, it's signaling a completion and a unity and growth, all because of love. So when love is present, when Christ is present, there is a bond of perfectness, and that's where your unity stems from. It's from the love that is seen. He goes on down in that same pack passage and he says that we are to be a people of peace, which I referred to earlier. We are to walk in peace. It's a part of our identity. He says we are one body. 
We are unified. We are stronger together. It's part of our identity. That's how we were made to be, is to lean on each other. When he created our identity, he understood the importance of gathering together and looking for strength, but so many times we see that as weakness. But that's how he made our identity, is to be able to come together. And he says we are stronger when we are one. He goes on to say that we are to be thankful in the good and in the bad on the mountain and in the valley, because it's really easy to be thankful when everything looks great, but it's a lot harder in the midst of a struggle to be thankful. But we are instructed to be thankful all the time and to always have hearts of thanksgiving. And that leads right into the last point that he said, and he talked about worship, to sing his praise and to give our hearts full of thankfulness. And it's not just about when you're on a platform or when you're singing a song or when you're holding a mic. Worship is a 24-7 encounter. It's a 24-7 thankfulness and always having that heart where you're giving and you're understanding and you're coming to be humbly before him. It's an attitude. It's not just a song. And I think we have to get to really the root of what worship is. And all of that comes together to be a new man, to be a new garment. That's the identity that we accept when we accept this identity. And it also talks about how we have family roles, too. Starting in verse 18 of that same exact passage, I'm going to read from there, Colossians 3, 18 to 21. It talks a little bit about our family roles, the biblical family structure. As a new wife, I've been studying, you know, what does it mean to be a wife, to be a woman of God, to help lead in a household. And I've been really searching out what a woman is called to be. But this one kind of gives just a short little bit about what each role in the household is. And if you really want to talk about an identity crisis in the nation, you can talk about the identity of a family. Because our current society has tried to redefine family on so many aspects. It's causing an identity crisis and it's causing confusion. They tried to go against, directly against, the biblical principles that are laid out before us when they did that. They tried to redo what the roles in the households could be. They tried to redefine what the role of love could be. They tried to rename what marriage was or what union was as a whole. And it goes down to even they tried to redefine what the roles in the household was, what the tear is supposed to look like. The entire identity of a family is under attack. So now is such an important time to understand what is your role in your family? What is your family doing? Because that is where revival can begin. It's in the home. And once our homes are in order, we can come into the house. And that's when true freedom and revival can break out. But we have to have our family in order before that can happen. So quickly, starting in verse number 18, first he speaks to the wives. And he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So it's a life of submission. But that's only one aspect of it. But as it says, as it is fit in the Lord. So the man has to be under God. He has to be doing what is fit to the Lord so that then his wife can submit and help him. So it all comes together. Each person has to be doing their role for the family to succeed. So then we deal straight with the husbands. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. That's the idea where it says to love like Christ loves the church. What an unconditional love that is. That's true love, true acts of service, truly understanding the uncontainable amount of love that that means. And once the husband in his order, then the wife can submit. And now we've got the parents under control, right? But now we got to get to the children. And it says, children... Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. That's pleasing unto the Lord, when a child obeys. Because when the parents are under God's alignment, the husband has submitted, the wife submits to the husband, and the children submit to their rule. Well, now we have a household that is ready to reap the harvest. Now we have a household that can go and speak revival. But first, they have to understand their critical roles in doing so. And then it goes back to the fathers, and it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, at least they be discouraged. So it's saying not out of fear, but out of the love of that Christ showed for us. Not to paralyze them or to try to harm them and to try to do it out of your own self, but because Christ loved us enough to give us rules. He loved us enough to set some boundaries to keep us safe. So that's how our parents are supposed to structure us. Leads right back into why the children have to obey. It's all connected. And when we begin to operate in the roles that the Lord has restored for us in our biblical households, then we can see true change. But it's not until then. And I can go on about all the characteristics and those that the church are supposed to walk in. And this was just a short list of what I felt like the Lord was speaking to me tonight about the biblical roles and the identity that we have in Christ. But I think that too many times we sit around in disguise. 
and we sit here with fake smiles and a nice outward appearance and we try to hide what's going on on the inside because we think we have internal shortcomings. We'll even sometimes focus so much on our outward appearance that it consumes us as a way to occupy ourselves from what's really going on on the inside. When the labels of oppression and anxiety, loneliness, fearfulness, and sadness, they're ever present in the world, but they're also sitting with us in the church. We find unhappiness, sorrow, discontentment, and bitterness lingering in the air. But I didn't read any of those things as part of our identity. So consumed in an identity that we try to be coming off as altogether lovely. We wear a disguise because we don't want to be seen as broken. We want to be seen as perfect. But I've yet to meet a perfect person. In fact, there was only one. And we are simply called to be broken vessels. We're not supposed to have it all together. And it's okay to have shortcomings. We don't have to put on a mask or an act to try to make that fact not true because that's how it was supposed to be. We are the clay. Clay doesn't look perfect. It gets molded over and over again. And why is it so important that we have it together? It's simply not. We are called to surrender. We are called to give ourselves fully and to embrace this new identity, not to be perfect. And I want to look at this other verse about our identity. And I find it in 1 Corinthians 15, as I'm turning there. Just a moment. We have an identity outside of a disguise, and it's all the things that I have described to us so far. It's something that Jade said a while back, and it's always stuck with me. If only we saw ourselves as as big of a threat as the enemy sees us as. If only we understood the power that we hold, that we're more than just the labels that try to stick with us, but if we were a little bit more vibrant and more like Christ, if we really accepted our identity, what a change we could make. If we walked around like we were truly free and we basked in the greatnessness that we find ourselves in. And I look at this verse, and Paul was speaking here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 9. And he says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God before. So he's saying, I am not worthy, and it's not in myself. But verse 10 But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet it was not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. I think that is such an important verse because when we begin to claim these things, we have to remember that it is not within ourselves. This identity is not our fleshly identity, but it is through Christ. So in the spirit of Paul saying that with so much humility and so much selflessness, it's time to recognize that I myself was unworthy and broken, but God. And that's the attitude that we have to carry our identity with. Just as Paul said here, we have to come humbly to where we can say, I'm an overcomer because he overcame. I have joy for he has given it to me. I have peace from the Lord. I am blessed because he chose to bless me. I am healed because he bore the stripes. And I am washed clean because of his blood. And I am standing because of his strength. And I have knowledge because I found wisdom in his word. And I am changed because of his mercy, because of his grace. And I have freedom because he broke my chains. I have life because of his death. And I am enough because he was enough for me. And that's what we have to get ourselves down to, understanding that I am because he is. Because all that I have and all that I am, if we take on this identity, we are saying he has consumed ourselves and it is all because of him. So we need to just put away the disguise 
and be who we truly are because he has given us a new identity. So it's time to just put the fakeness away and the time for playing church and just going through the motions and the act. It's long past. There's Halloween for the disguises. We don't need those every day in our lives. We need to live our lives seeking our true identity. We don't need a mask or a fake aid, but it's time to be real and to be the church because the world doesn't need a show and the church doesn't need a show and I don't need a show and we have family members that don't need a show and friends that don't need a show and a community that doesn't need a show. I don't know of anyone that needs a show, but they need someone that is real and who comes humbly saying, I understand who I am because of who he is and what he can do for you. Because if we would truly begin to operate in this identity that I have described tonight, we would walk around in the virtues of Christ. And that's what the world really needs to see. They need to see the joy. They need to see the overcomers. They need to see a people that have peace and who understand their role under God. So I challenge you tonight to operate in the fullness that God has gifted you because sitting dormant or just playing a part, that's just not going to cut it anymore. Because there are souls depending on it. There are members around us depending on it. Yourself is depending on it. Your children are depending on it. The disguise needs to be sat down and a new identity needs to be fully taken on and fully consume us so that we can truly be who God has called us to be. It may look different and it may sound different, but if God said it, then let it be. It's not our place to judge how it's supposed to come or what form it's going to look like when it gets here. And those that will do that, when the God is calling us higher, he says to touch not my anointed. So he will deal with that himself. So you just let it come through you in whatever form that may be. And if it's a little different, then let it be a little different. And if it doesn't look perfect, we're not called to be perfect. So I don't know why we have that idea anyways. Because when we operate in obedience, that's when the change will come. That's when the identity is truly bestowed upon us. It means setting everything else aside. And do we not owe him at least that? To put ourselves away and say, it's not about me, but it's about him. That's when the thankfulness and the praise will truly begin to be in effect. And I am feeling very thankful today. And I recognized how blessed we are as a people to have a God that loved us so much that he provided us this new identity, that he gifted us these new garments to put on. So as we go forth, let us do it for his glory. And I believe that he will provide everything that we need. When the mask comes off and the disguise comes off, and at the end of the day, it's just you and him. It's just that intimacy. It's just him holding you in his hand and you being looking more like him. That's the identity we need to get to. And that's the place we need to be to in the church today. I feel like we have enough of the disguises and enough of the play. But it's time to be real and to be who God has called us to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give her another hand tonight. Amen. I, I, I'm not going to add to. I'm just going to give you a thought if you'll stand across the house tonight. I was sitting there thinking. So often, you know, she we kept referencing the fact that we... The old things have passed away. It's what scripture says. Behold, all things are made new. It's not only so often we see it as when we hear it, we take on a new identity. What we really do is we figure out through the power of the Holy Spirit who we really were meant to be. A lot of people hear that, oh, I'm a new person. They think of uh, well, well, that, that it's, it's, it's something that I'm not supposed to be. No, that's who God intended you for, to be. But through sin and through life and through all the things we go to, we, we don't realize that that's not what we are intended to be. But through His grace and through the shedding of His blood, He's saying, not only am I making things new, it's new, it's fresh to you, but that's who you were really meant to be. But something I kept thinking about as she spoke and I just want to give you a simple simple definition she she spoke so well about the structure of a family the structure of a Christian life many of you may know this term it's called infrastructure 
We hear about it politically, all week, the infrastructure bill. I think there was one just passed last year. It doesn't have anything to do with infrastructure, actually. But they called it an infrastructure bill. But what is infrastructure? It's the underlining foundation or the basic framework. Let me put it to you this way. How many loves road construction? I don't. It's inconvenient. But you don't realize that that's infrastructure. Because there's times in our life where our spirit man, well, constantly really is under construction. And it seems inconvenient because if you're surrendering, like Sister Maddie was telling you tonight, there's things, and Pastor can tell you, in ministry there are things that get taken away because they're not beneficial to your spiritual growth and your spiritual life. There's things that the the Bible tells us plainly in 2 Corinthians that we are to come out from among the world and be separate. And all those things in in our natural mind, they seem, Royetta, they seem so inconvenient. And I I began to think of, uh, of the between Liberty and 44 is closed for like 180 days. You know how inconvenient it was to go around, hit 27, go up to... It's inconvenient. But now when you drive down through there, there's no bumps, there's no potholes before you hit that bridge. I said, what are you getting at? What I'm saying is there are things that this world cannot see that's going on on the inside of you. If you surrender... If you yield to the Spirit of God. And it may seem inconvenient to you at times, but that infrastructure, that spiritual infrastructure that the Holy Spirit is giving you, there's going to come a time when that's put to the test. Is it really, God, are you really making me new? Are you really changing the way I think? Are you really changing the way I act? Are you really changing the way I talk, the way I see things? And there's going to come times that you're tested. And we're going to see if if what the Holy Spirit is doing on the inside of you is working. And you'll find that people will see in you what God has been doing on the inside of you for years, months, weeks. Infrastructure is not always seen. It's not always visible. But if you allow yourself to become who God has genuinely created you to be, Tests come. As Sister Maddie says, when the tests come, you'll have joy when nobody else has joy. You'll have peace when nobody else has peace. You'll know what to do. I believe this. When nobody else knows what to do. You'll stand when everybody else is buckling under the weight. surrender and allow Him to build in us the person that we were always meant to be. And that is an overcomer. That is someone that the Bible says, this is, this is what I love that, that Paul told Timothy, and I, I end with this. He said, God has not given you a spirit of fear. Let me put that into context. Every time fear comes up in our life, that's not of God. That's crazy. It's easy to be afraid. Every time fear comes up, you have to tell yourself. You have to put down that flesh and say, you know what? You're telling me to be afraid right now, but this is not God-given. What did Paul tell Timothy? He said, God has given you a spirit of power of love and of a sound mind. build you, let Him create you, let Him mold you, let Him make you. So they will see. Not just so you will see, so they will see what God has been doing, that infrastructure that He's been building on the inside of you. If you would just take the hand of the person next to you this evening. 
God, we come before you tonight. And Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in the faith. And Lord God, I decree and declare as as Sister Maddie preached over us tonight, talked to, to us tonight, Lord God, let all the facades come off. Let all the perceptions, Lord, that we try to put off and the images that we, we try to let people see, let them come off. And Lord God, let, let your spirit begin to take over in our lives, Jesus. Uh, and Father, we ask uh, that your Holy Ghost uh, just take control, uh, mold us, make us, form us in your likeness, uh, make us more like you, Jesus. Uh, change and transform our minds and how we think and, and how we see things. God, give us the power of your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, you begin to move upon us again. Lord, I pray for this congregation tonight, a boldness, a boldness to walk in the anointing and the authority that you have given them. Lord, to walk, uh, Lord Jesus, knowing that they are a child uh, of of the true King. Lord, never let them look to the left or to the right or to social media or to television to figure out who they are. But Lord, let them realize that your word declares who we are. Let us not be a people absent joy, absent peace, absent power. Let us be full of joy, full of peace, and full of power. And let us live that way. Lord, let us know that we are people that have been anointed by your Spirit. And let us act as people that are anointed by your Spirit. Not in arrogance, Father, but in the confidence that your Word gives us. And Lord, I declare it over this congregation and the people of this house. In Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. Give Sister Maddie another hand tonight. Listen, I, I, I know pastors spoke about it before, and I, I've spoken about it before, but it gives me such hope to see these young men and women declaring the Word of God. Because, listen, I, I'm not going to live forever, but it's good to know that these young people are picking up the Word of God and picking up the mantle and running after Jesus And that should give us great comfort, and we should be proud of them. Hey, everyone. uh, Cameron here from PTC Ministries. I'm so glad that you could join us today uh, for the message here. Uh, I hope the message touched you uh, in a personal way, and that you could take that and mold that and move it and let it move you in your life. And as you can continue your walk with Christ, continue your walk with us as well. Follow us. uh, Click in the link below in the description there. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. And don't forget to uh, like and subscribe. Uh, I feel like a YouTuber here, but don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to uh, stay connected with us. Um, And thank you for joining us.